here's an idea. Bob Dylan is literature because anything can be literature. The question what is literature is not one that often captures the public's attention, but recently it did after famed American folk musician Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature. The takes, they were both many and hot, hinging on one central conceit. Is Bob Dylan's work hey, Mr. Man, play a song for me. literary? And if it is, wait, really? But also, how does it then relate to, uh, you know, literature? like? big books and stuff. To answer that question, we have to depart from it for a little while and ask what sort of thing do we normally call literature and why? Judging the question empirically doesn't make it easy, unfortunately. Literature is Ovid's Metamorphosis and Proust's In Search of Lost Time, both lengthy but poetry and prose respectively. It's Borges' Collected Fictions and Cervantes' Don Quixote, both written in Spanish but a collection of shorts on one hand and a tome on the other. Dickens' Great Expectations, Morrison's Beloved, Joyce's Ulysses, Wolf's To the Lighthouse, and Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita are all literature. Simple, inscrutable, slow, intense, based on true events, totally fantastical, deadly serious, and seriously uproarious. Maybe then it's more helpful to talk about what literature isn't. Up until a few weeks ago, most of us probably wouldn't have said song lyrics are literature, even if some ancient verse definitely is. Romance novels are rarely considered literature, though lots of literature does contain pretty steamy romance. Fanfic, death not lit. Unless you count, like, Virgil's Aeneid or Goethe's Faust, both of which are responses to and extensions of well-known works that came before them. Fantasy and sci-fi are rarely considered literature. Arguably, Lord of the Rings is close and Harry Potter is on its way. Comics are not literature. Except Art Spiegelman's Mouse won the Pulitzer Prize in 1992. That was controversial, though because it's neither fiction nor nonfiction, not because of the drawings. Huh, this is complicated. How do we sort it all out? Well, British literary theorist Terry Eagleton provides one way. In his appropriately titled essay, What is Literature? He suggests we think of literature less as some inherent quality or set of qualities displayed by certain kinds of writing from Beowulf to Virginia Woolf than as a number of ways in which people relate themselves to writing. In other words, literature is less a category of writing and more a category of feeling towards certain written things. It tells us about what we do, not about the fixed being of things, Eagleton says. Dylan's award, from this perspective, is more about people than about his work. Eagleton dismisses the notion that there's some essence shared by all literature. His claim is that anything can be literature as long as it's the correct kind of writing, but correctness is arbitrary, emergent, consensual, and shifting. And by this same token, not only can anything become literature, but Eagleton points out, anything which is regarded as unalterably and unquestionably literature, Shakespeare, for example, can cease to be literature. This may seem drastic. An increasingly liberal idea of what text-based works are literary, okay, but are we ready to accept the notion that though Shakespeare's works may remain stable, we might change so much that whatever we look for in literature, we will no longer find it there? How do we, I mean, that just, it sounds bananas. Shakespeare just is literature, isn't it? Maybe for a second we should examine the idea that the literary does have some fundamental essence. Broadly speaking, there is a kind of convention to classic literature. It's thoughtful, impactful, complicated. Critic Roman Jacobson has said literary fiction constitutes an organized violence committed on ordinary speech. In other less literary words, lit talks fancy. And maybe that's its essence. Literary language is intense, highfalutin, and it draws attention to itself. This idea of lit was advanced most famously by the Russian formalists, Viktor Shlavsky, Asap Burek, Roman Jacobson. They were concerned foremost with what made up the text, its words. Rather than focus on what texts are about, a formalist definition of literature focuses on what the text is. For them, the literary isn't found in the story because what a text is about is simply motivation for a particular narrative exercise. Subject matter is fuel for the words and language fire. Or to put it another way, Frankenstein isn't about a mad genius putting body parts together to make a monster. It's about a different mad genius in our world putting words, structure, and narrative devices together to make another monster literature. 
For the formalists, a literary work is a collection of devices, imagery, syntax, rhythm, meter, sound, etc., and they all exert a kind of defamiliarizing effect. When we encounter literary language, we're forced out of our stale responses to the world. And this is one reason literature has a reputation for difficulty. It makes us struggle with language, and through that struggle, we have a deeper and more intimate encounter with the world. The words, they do a brain thing. And interestingly enough, there's some recent evidence that suggests this is true. In a 2013 paper that was met with a bit of skepticism, psychologists David Kidd and Emmanuel Castano found that exposure to literary fiction fosters one's ability to empathize with others. Kidd and Castano's hypothesis was that literary fiction uniquely engages the psychological processes needed to gain access to characters' subjective experiences, and fictions pose fewer risks than the real world, presenting opportunities to consider the experiences of others without facing the potentially threatening consequences of that engagement source. They replicated their results this year, judging test subjects' familiarity with the works of many literary and non-literary authors, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Joyce Carol Oates, Umberto Eco, Jackie Collins, Maya Angelou, and found that the habitual engagement with others' minds, even fictional ones, provided by literature specifically, may improve the psychological processes supporting intersubjectivity, aka empathy, also source. Their study even draws on a Russian formalist concept of literature, citing other studies which support literature's ability to disrupt routine or rigid modes of thinking. They reference literary works known for the fine quality of their writing and roundness of their characters. They point to multiple plot lines, shifting perspectives, ambiguous outcomes, and the complexity of figurative writing as aspects which encourage readers towards the interpretive engagement needed for both literature and theory of mind, the human capacity to comprehend that other people hold beliefs and desires, and that these may differ from one's own beliefs and desires. So, okay, maybe literature really does have some essence, and this essence has to do with the interpretive engagement related to big words and complex characters, but ugh, get ready for another stick in the spokes here, because how does this explain literature without big words or round characters that still do the thing? Think of like All Quiet on the Western Front, The Old Man in the Sea, or even Bob Dylan lyrics, which are variously plain spoken and or straightforwardly characterized, but still literary, still defamiliarizing. There's also all kinds of stuff that's defamiliarizing, which is rarely, if ever, considered literary. Jokes, Twitter bots, weird signage, and YouTube video titles, everything, given the right context, can have that estranging effect that forces us out of our stale responses to the world. Just because a text is ordinary doesn't mean it can't upend one's experience, but neither does that immediately make it literature. The truth may be that literature sometimes meets certain criteria, but often is called literature because we want to call it that, because calling something literature makes it valuable, and value can't be divorced from those who hold it. And like the populace, it changes and shifts. As uncomfortable as it might be to admit, it's possible, if unlikely, that on the horizon there exists a society so changed and shifted that Shakespeare is no longer literature. Someone please write a dystopian sci-fi novel with this as the starting premise. Maybe by the time the actual dystopia hits, it will be literature. When we label something literature, we're not making a simple factual statement about the characteristics of a work of art. We're communicating about what we consider worthwhile alongside the characteristics of a work of art. The same goes for our current golden age of television, and for graphic novels or computer games that become art over pop culture, and to some extent even YouTubers who can become real celebrities rather than just internet famous. Each of these designations functions similarly to literature. There may be aesthetic, formal, even psychological inspiration for labeling them, but we also want to communicate their importance, their value. When we categorize culture, we make visible a teeny, tiny portion of the concealed structure of values that informs us and the decisions we make. This is what Eagleton is getting at. Though we may dig into the text itself and even our brains for some formalist support, is what you'll find there really the reason we call something literature? Maybe. But just as likely you'll find long-standing systems which value certain characteristics or people or types of work simply because those characteristics, people, and works are what is valued. After all, deeming something literature isn't just a mental exercise. It motivates sales, justifies curricula, and sits at the center of a whole heck of a lot of cultural power. So to get back to our original question, it may be that the Nobel Prize finally recognizes Bob Dylan for what he is, a literary master or it may be an encouragement to view his work in a way we don't normally. It may be a sign or an encouragement that literature has, is, or must change. And, or, it's another way, amongst many, of letting the public know, hey, 
Bob Dylan? He's lit, fam. What do y'all think? Do we designate something literature because of some fundamental essence, some cultural value, somewhere in between some combination of the two? And if so, why? And how do you think Bob Dylan fits into all of this? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. And you know, another interesting part of this conversation is the whole situation with Bob Dylan not accepting his win. And you know, we can speculate about why it is he might do that. He does have a reputation for being, you know, someone who isn't really interested in in uh, awards, not really interested in being in the public eye, not super interested in press. Uh, but you know, maybe a lot of that has to do with how he thinks of his work and how he sees it relating to, you know, things like a Nobel Prize. Uh, so I think this that's also a really interesting part of this conversation. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding the experience machine and hedonism. If you wanna watch that one, you can click here or find a link in the doobly-doo. We have one small request for next week's episode, which is going to be about romantic Overwatch fan art. And the question, the request is, if you or someone you know happens to make that kind of thing, specifically single panel images, single panel illustrations, we would love to have permission to use it on the show to illustrate some of the points that we're making, all of which are about celebration um, and exploration, not you know being judgmental or, or weird about it. So we'll put a link to a post that I wrote on Tumblr in the description if you want to see more details. But uh, we would, yeah, we would love to have some fan art that we have permission to use because we like to be you know super careful about making sure we don't put fan art in places that it's not supposed to be. So uh, yeah, link to that in the place where the links are. This week, we are also having the second discussion for the Idea Channel Book Club. Details for that also below. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit. The tweet of the week comes from Dre Sands, who points us towards a Rob Bashiza tweet that includes a, a screenshot of an Apple review written by Borges. And it is, it, it, it is perfect. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these honorees.